or we'll be on the recording. Or we'll be on the recording. Okay, so that's going. And we're almost at the top of the hour. So we're gonna let in some attendees. We've got a recording going for later. Backup recordings going. Welcome everyone. We're just gonna get started in a moment. We're just letting all of you in. Okay, we're nearing the top of the hour now. I'm just gonna do a short introduction and then Catherine and Julie, I'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Okay, welcome everybody. This is the Friday webinar. I'm Executive Director of Conservatory Canada, Derek Auger. Thanks for joining us for the Friday webinar here today. Just a moment here for all of you to finish logging in, those of you that are joining us live, and welcome to all of you on the CCTV YouTube channel who are joining us live as well. That's where you can all watch the replay later, and welcome to those of you who are watching the replay anytime after the fact. Uh, today is Friday, November 3rd, uh, 2023, just as a timestamp. And I'll just give you a quick rundown on what we have coming up on future Fridays here. Next Friday, we're going to be joined by our stalwarts, Eleanor Gummer and Cecile de Rosier. They're going to be presenting the music of Louise Longens Jaffa using two publications that Eleanor has just recently put out this year here the Sonatine and Six Bluet. I just happen to have these here, so I thought I'd hold them up. Those will be the publications they're gonna be talking from next Friday. The Friday after we take the week off, Conservatory Canada has its annual general meeting in London, Ontario, as well as our convocation and awards ceremony. And we have quite a number of students and teachers and examiners from across the country joining us there to gather live. First time since 2019, so we're really looking forward to that event. And so we'll rejoin you at the Friday webinar, November 24th. We're going to have Alessandra DiCenzo, a CC examiner, uh, who's done quite a bit of research on reading methods. And so I've been trying to get her for a couple of years to come on and talk to us about what the research shows in terms of things like middle C position, starting on the black keys, and what that means for research and, and, and what she has found in terms of what works for students. And she's going to follow up on some of that research in subsequent webinars in the new year as well. Starting December 1st, we're going to have a trio of webinars uh, with George Lithurst, whom most of you know. Uh, he's the software developer. We use his Time Warp Technology software for our MIDI exams. And he's joined us many times to talk about SuperScore app. And so he's going to do uh, a number of things. Starting December 1st, he's going to talk about the music of Ignatius Sancho. And then December 8th, he's going to be joined by another guest, and they're going to review the music of, and life of Clementi, which will be a really interesting webinar. And then early in the new year, likely on Friday, January 12th, after our holiday break, is going to be joined by Stella Sick from Minnesota, and they're going to talk about the waltz. So those are some upcoming webinars. You'll get links from me, those of you on the email list. And if you're not on the email list, you can email me, Derek, D-E-R-E-K, at conservatorycanada.ca, so that you get the registration links in your inbox a week or two ahead of time. So look for an email, everybody, next week, and I'll give you some new registration links for those upcoming webinars reaching us into December. And so today's guests, Catherine Fisher and Dr. Julie Haig are joining us, and they've created the Piano Safari Beginner Piano Method. This is in our ongoing series, looking at beginner piano methods and beginner piano pedagogy in general. And we look forward to what they're having to say. So I'm going to turn this over to Julie and Catherine now. If anyone has any questions, just throw those in the chat box or the Q&A as we go, and we'll stop and answer those at an appropriate time. So Catherine and Julie, take it away. Thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you so much, Derek, and, and it's wonderful to be here today, and we're so excited to share about Piano Safari. Today in the overview workshop, Julie and I will be focusing on level one because it does provide the foundational pedagogy for the entire series. We may have time to touch on levels two or three briefly at the end so you can get a feel for how the method progresses, uh, but we'll see how that goes as time allows. So here's a picture of Julie and I. We are recently in England, and here we are at um, a university in Greenwich, where we got to give a piano safari uh, workshop. And um, <clears throat> just to give a little bit of background about how we met, we were students together at the University of Oklahoma. So here's a picture of 
Carpenter Hall where we had our graduate offices. And while we were there, we quickly discovered we had a mutual dream of writing a piano method. So we had regular meetings outside of class to discuss our ideas. And this is when we began the initial sketches for what would become Repertoire Book One. It actually took us 10 years of work and research before we actually released the first level, and that was around the year of 2012. Since that time, we've created a large number of additional pedagogical projects um, products and we're continually creating new materials and it's something we just love to do. The core piano safari method has three levels and it's designed for the average age beginner, students who are between the ages of six and ten. It generally takes the average student a full year or sometimes even longer to complete level one. The level one pack consists of the repertoire book one, an all-in-one book that features pieces, technique, improvisation, and theory and the sight reading and rhythm cards, which correlate with the repertoire book. These cards are indispensable for providing the necessary reinforcement for learning to read music and tap rhythms with confidence. A supplemental theory book for extra writing practice is also available. Because of the various types of pieces in Piano Safari, we've organized today's workshop topically to cover four types of pieces, rote, reading, technique, and improvisation. Keep in mind, though, that students are working on all four of these, these types of pieces simultaneously throughout the book in each unit. As Catherine and I taught many different methods over our early years of teaching, we discovered that most methods are strictly reading based. Students play only what they can read. The other extreme is a rote learning method in which students learn entirely by rote, copying the teacher's example. So as we began writing Piano Safari, we thought, what would happen if we put the two together, teaching rote and reading simultaneously? What happened was that students became confident readers through our systematic reading approach, and they became excited about playing the piano and became very skilled in musical and rhythmic understanding through learning the more complicated rote pieces. So the reading pieces taught visual literacy and the rote pieces taught oral literacy. <clears throat> This combination of rote and reading <clears throat> provides the most unique feature of the Piano Safari method, and we have found that along with it providing a well-rounded learning approach for all beginning students, it also works well with addressing a student's strengths or weaknesses. For example, if a student struggles with learning to read music, but is gifted orally, if they are in a method book that is 100% reading based, the less lessons could become frustrating. So using a combination of reading and a rote allows students to address weaknesses while also celebrating their strengths. Let's now explore the idea of rote teaching a little bit further. We look at rote teaching in a specific way, which we'll outline in a moment. But first, here is what we do not mean by rote teaching. We are not training students to copy the teacher without any thought or understanding. And we're not creating students who will forever be reliant on playing by ear without learning to read. Instead, we are offering a new paradigm for using rote teaching in a specifically applied way. So now for our definition of what rote teaching is. We define it as the systematic introduction of musical and artistic concepts that are best introduced by modeling rather than from the notated score. Music is an aural art and it transcends notation. As Francis Clark, author of The Music Tree Method, famously said, sound should come before symbol. So if we think for a moment about language acquisition, we can see the similarities. Children hear English or their native language from the time they're babies and they're read to from books that are much too hard for them to read themselves, but which they can easily understand. They see the words printed on the page, but cannot yet read them. But at the same time, they'll be learning the basics of the alphabet and how letters are put together to form words and sentences. Eventually, they're able to read anything as their visual literacy catches up to their oral literacy. This very same process works for learning music. Students hear more complicated music from the time they're babies, 
and then we teach them pieces by rote that are too hard for them to read themselves, but which they can easily play and that contain patterns that they understand. And at the same time, they're working on their reading basics. Gradually, their reading level catches up to their playing level. Can you imagine if we told children, you're not allowed to look at any book unless you can read all the words. And yet, this is sometimes how we teach music. You're not allowed to play any pieces until you can read all the notes. Our new paradigm for rote teaching includes the following concepts. Rote teaching is for beginners. Since children are capable of understanding and playing much more complicated music than they can read, rote teaching is ideally suited for use with beginners while we're also laying the foundation for the reading skills that they need to master. Rote pieces are at the student's playing level, which is much more difficult than a beginner's reading level and rote teaching must be paired with reading instruction. Students should learn row pieces alongside a separate body of reading pieces. And row pieces should be based on keyboard patterns that are easy to understand and remember by beginners who don't have any theory background. We also want to emphasize that not every piece is a good row piece. A good rote piece is one that is designed with keyboard patterns in mind, which are easily understood by students who are just beginning piano. So it's not saying, play this note, now play this note, now play this note, one note at a time. This is not a pattern that the children can hang on to. Instead, when a young child walks up to a piano, they often doodle a chromatic pattern because the idea of black, white, black, white makes total sense to them. So this is a pattern they understand. Other patterns young children understand are groups of two and three black keys or white key groups like the music alphabet. So our rote pieces in Piano Safari were composed specifically with these and other patterns in mind. This teaches students that music is not a random collection of notes, but is created using logical patterns. Also, because these patterns yield chromatic, pentatonic, and whole tone sounds, the student's ears are open to a variety of sounds. We'll now show you two examples of some rote pieces in the beginning of level one. Alphabet Boogie is taught at the very first lesson. The pattern used in this rote piece is the music alphabet. So we teach it by showing the student what to play directly on the piano. And if you see in the upper right-hand corner, in the little gray box, it says rote. So this tells you as the teacher that you're to teach this piece by rote, just showing them the pattern on the piano. So the way we do this is just to say, can you make your hand look like this and play this pattern? Continuing all the way up the keyboard. In this way, the student is focused on the technical motion of the forearm, the sound, and the pattern of the music alphabet. So the student learns and memorizes the rote pieces simultaneously. Here is how Alphabet Boogie sounds with the accompaniment. example of a rote piece is I Like Bananas, which is a more complicated one. It has a chromatic pattern that goes like this. White, black, black, white, black. They then move that pattern up to the next group of notes and play the same thing. White, black, black, white, black. Then we move up and play it again. And then yum, yum, yum. And the piece continues up using these same patterns. So although it sounds complicated, it's really just two patterns. So let's watch the video of this of Catherine's daughter playing this one.
lot of fun also because students can substitute the original words, which are, I like bananas just like a monkey, with other foods and animals, such as, I like spaghetti just like a tiger. This activity encourages students to repeat the piece multiple times just so they can play the different combinations of foods and animals. To show you the scope of the book and how far students progress in their rote playing, here is the last rote piece in level one, Monkey Blues. You might be wondering how students remember road pieces when they practice at home. On the videos page of our website and on YouTube, you can find reminder videos and these are mini tutorials to remind the student of the patterns and how to play the piece. We've just highlighted three of the many row pieces found in level one. <clears throat> so I encourage you, if you have Piano Safari, to play through more of the row pieces on your own so you can learn more about the interesting sounding pieces students learn in level one. But for now, we're going to go ahead and move to our next topic, which is reading. Our philosophy of reading includes three main ideas. First, we believe that reading music well is only part of being musically literate. The other part is understanding music, which is absorbed through rote pieces. Second, learning to read music should be systematic, using a very logical step-by-step -step approach. And third, students require much more reinforcement and repetition for each reading concept than we might think. Just as students don't learn to read, their native language in a few months and instead require constant practice at reading increasingly complicated books over a period of several years. So we should not expect students to be able to spontaneously read music well without the same number of years of repetition and reinforcement of notation and reading concepts at the piano. In the Piano Safari approach, students learn music learn reading through recognizing intervals, finding patterns, connecting the visual with the aural, and developing the ability to audiate sound, to be able to hear it in their heads, and finally learning note names. All of these components combine to create fluent reading. Being able to read is not just about recognizing notes on the staff. The intervallic reading approach that we use in Piano Safari was pioneered in the 1950s and 60s by Clark, Chronister, and Blickenstaff. This approach trained students to see the interrelationship of notes rather than viewing each note as its own individual unit. So for example, in this melody, students learn that the first note is G. They would put their finger five on G and then read by direction and interval. So seconds down, sames or unisons, and then seconds up. So you'll see what I mean as we take a tour in a moment through some of the units of level one. Advanced pianists who are excellent sight readers also read using patterns. Rather than seeing only the note names as shown in this intermediate Clementi Sonatina, which would be rather complicated, good sight readers see patterns and shapes like this. So we see inversions, we see scales, octave patterns, left-hand accompaniment patterns. These are things that would pop out of this sonatina to us if we were reading it as a more advanced musician. Although good sight readers do have an undercurrent of instantly knowing all of the note names, Fluent reading comes primarily from seeing shapes and patterns of melodies and chords, uh, such as I just described to you in this piece. So knowing the note names and reading by interval and pattern are both important. The question is really, which comes first, the note names or the intervals? The intervals or the note names? 
We believe it can go either way, but in an intervallic reading approach, we have chosen to introduce the intervals first. So after students do have a solid foundation in the basics of reading intervallically, we train them to recognize individual note names using things like note flashcard drills, theory pages, and apps like Notebrush. We formally present this at the beginning of Piano Safari Level 2, but you can start this process earlier if you choose. Now for our philosophy of rhythm. Optimally, experiencing rhythm comes before learning its notation. Students gain experience with the rhythm by listening to music and learning the rope pieces. Teaching students common rhythmic patterns helps organize their understanding. In Piano Safari, this is done with the animal rhythm patterns, which we'll show you in a minute. The syllabic counting system, counting with taws, comes before students learn to count metrically, and metric counting is introduced at the beginning of level two. For our syllabic counting system, we use a modified Kodai-Gordon approach that keeps ta on the main beat. So quarter notes are ta and eighth notes are ta-ti, ta-ti. We have found that introducing this syllabic system helps students solidify their sense of pulse and easily master subdivisions before the added complexity of counting with numbers is added. While students need to learn each rhythmic value individually, we also want them to recognize the rhythms in larger pattern groups, which is why we have created the animal rhythm patterns. These are related to the earliest rope pieces and animal techniques in level one. Even our youngest students easily recognize these patterns when they're tied to the animal names. So we have Charlie Chipmunk, Hippo, Roar, two, three, four, Tall Giraffe, Zechariah Zebra, and Kangaroo, Kangaroo. While students are working on rope pieces that are above their reading level, but well within their technical and musical grasp, they're also learning to read music notation through a step-by-step -step approach. The reading pieces are found in the repertoire book, and 16 sight reading and rhythm cards correlate with each unit of the book. So unit one begins with pre-staff reading on the black keys. Unit two has pre-staff reading on the white keys. Unit 3 introduces the staff and the intervals of unisons and seconds. In Unit 4, students learn the interval of a third, and seconds and thirds are combined at the end of the book in Unit 5. So let's take a brief journey through the book with each of these units. We begin with Unit 1, pre-staff notation on the black keys. Ocean Animals is the first reading piece in the book. In order to develop a good piano hand shape and play with strong tone, we have students play all the pieces and sight reading cards in the first half of the book with a non-legato articulation. To help students master this, we often ask them to tap the rhythm and then play it on the fallboard before playing on the piano. So for ocean animals, we can play it on the fallboard. Two, 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 three, 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 four, two, three, three, three. So you can see my non-legato articulation coming from the forearm. We have found that insisting students play with this articulation prevents or solves 99% of technical problems. So that's why we have them do that. Preparation steps set the student up for their first successful attempts at then playing the piece on the piano. So after they play on the call board, they can transfer to that to the piano. So this is how this piece sounds with the accompaniment. Also, you'll notice in the upper right hand corner in the gray box, it says reading. So this tells you as the teacher that you should teach, that students should learn this piece by reading the notation as opposed to the rote pieces. Teachers often ask us the question, why pre-staff? Why not just start reading right on the staff? 
We begin with pre-staff notation because there's way too much information for the student to process on a page with the staff in their very first introduction to reading. For example, before playing this piece on the staff, the student would need to understand the clef, time signature, bar lines, finger numbers, what the notes are, intervals, the rhythm, lyrics, there's some Italian terms, and they have to have the technique to play the piece. This is a lot to expect a young student in their to master in their first introduction to reading. In contrast, pre-staff reading allows students to focus on a smaller range of concepts, including finger numbers, rhythm, tracking left to right, and playing with correct technique. This is plenty for the student to focus on at their first attempts at reading. So pictured here is a sight reading card from the first unit of level one. It uses pre-staff notation on the black keys. We have a separate right-hand line, a separate left-hand line, and a rhythm tapping exercise across the bottom. During this early stage of study, we work on the sight reading cards mainly in the lesson to be certain students are secure with the skills. If so, we send home a few cards and then check them again at the next lesson. Students cover 16 cards as they work through the corresponding pieces in unit one, and they're color-coded so you can easily see that it matches each unit. So here's the same card, and as you can see, it's marked with checks this time, and that indicates three successful repetitions for each exercise. Across the bottom, you'll see the rhythm tapping exercise with our syllabic system printed beneath. We typically count syllables with students first, and after that is completed successfully, we ask students to find the animals in the rhythm and they love to do this. So here we have Zachariah Zebra, Charlie Chipmunk, Zachariah Zebra, Charlie Chipmunk. So those animal rhythm patterns train them to see rhythms in larger pattern groups. In unit two, students are still reading pre-staff notation, but they're beginning on the different white keys. Once students enter this unit, it's important to spend time drilling where the white keys are located on the piano. One fun activity for teaching the white key names is to use the piano decorating kit. So here you can see a picture of my piano at home fully decorated, but we have these pieces which are basically like um, a game token. They're thick enough that they won't slide easily between those keys. So we have these giraffe rectangles for the groups of three black keys and we have little zebra triangles for the groups of two black keys. So students would begin by decorating their black key groups because those provide a reference point for the white keys. And then when you come to learning white key names, we have little colored um, tokens. They're always color coded. So for example, all of the C's are blue, um, but students find the white key letter names in relation to the black key groups again. So for example, C, would come before the zebra triangles. And I'm going to put my D and E on here also. So the pre-staff reading pieces that begin on the white keys are organized by groups. So one of them is the C, D, E group because it surrounds the group of two black keys. And then we also have the F, G, A, B group because those four notes surround the group of three black keys. For the CDE group, students first experience this group of white keys through playing CDE March, as you see pictured there, which is a rope piece. So we always want students to experience a concept and sound before they read the notation. To play this, students stand behind the piano and play every CDE group on the piano. Still using non-legato articulation as Julie has been uh, talking about. So once students understand the group of C, D, E, they're going to then transfer this knowledge to a reading piece. So 
what you just heard was the audio track with the accompaniment part. We try to make interesting accompaniments to go with these simple rope pieces. So a student would play that, and now you're going to see um, the reading piece pictured here, Mary Had a Little Lamb, using the same three groups of notes. So let's watch a video of a student playing this piece. <laughs> So moving on here, um, unit three is a pivotal moment in repertoire book one because this is where students learn to read on the staff. This can go very smoothly if time is taken to adequately prepare the student. So from their work with pre-staff notation, students already understand many concepts such as melodic direction, rhythmic notation, and finger numbers. And they've also developed basic technical control from their road pieces. Now the new concepts that are introduced are line and space notes and landmark notes. And in Piano Safari, we have treble G and bass C as landmark notes. And um, all of the reading pieces and sight reading exercises in level one do begin on one of these two landmark notes. Of course, with different finger numbers, so students are not getting locked into one position. After they understand landmarks, students learn about the interval of a second and how seconds move from a line to space or a space to a line. As we discussed a moment ago in the pre-staff card, one of the most important ways to set students up for success with reading is to provide clear preparation steps or steps for how to begin. We know as advanced musicians how important this is. Before we dive into a new piece, we need to check things like the meter and time signature, for instance, to just give context to what we're doing. The same types of analysis skills will help young students. The first step for a student at this level is to identify the clef. So in Piano Safari Level 1, the right hand is playing in the treble clef, so students color their clef sign with right hand red, and they're going to label the landmark uh, no, treble G in the same color. Next, we point at the first note on the card, up on the, fall, up on the music stand, and we speak through the melodic direction. So we would say, for example, G, down, down, up, up, down, down, all the way through the end of that first treble clef line. At this point, students are only playing seconds, so there's no need to look for thirds or skips. Finally, the student is going to identify the starting finger, and so in this case, it's four on their landmark, treble G, and they place their hand in position. It's a good idea at this point for the teacher to help with tracking by pointing above the note as the student plays. We use a similar process for the bass clef, but this time the color is light blue for left hand, and students label their left hand landmark note, bass C. So in this melody, notice that we have some repeated notes. So we call these unisons or sames, and we have students actually pick a different color, a colored pencil, and here they're going to look for the notes that stay the same and connect them with their colored pencil. So this very clearly shows how the melody moves down, stays the same, and moves up, stays the same. Those really illustrate the melodic contour. So um, we do have students play these uh, three times correctly also and mark them off with checks for each successful repetition. It's really amazing how well this system works of analyzing and marking the cards Students are reading music by contour, even though they don't know every single letter name at this point. They can concentrate solely on identifying intervals and melodic contour, and then they're going to learn those note names again at a later point. So looking ahead here, this is a reading piece from the same unit uh, as the green sight reading card we just showed you. 
It's my dog Fritz and we mark this in exactly the same way as I just showed you in the sight reading cards. The only thing we added here is the addition of an up arrow so students remember to move up an octave for the second line. I also wanted to mention about this piece, if you have a student who is technically adept and needs additional challenge, you can feel free to have them add the left hand an octave below and play in parallel motion. We suggest this for all single hand pieces. Um, since students are usually more technically adept because of their study of rope pieces, they're able to add this additional element of challenge after they've learned to read the piece. So remember the chicken and the egg that we had opted to teach students to read intervallically first? They will not formally start to memorize all of those note names on the staff until level two, but we can help them understand that note names are also important by making what we like to term note name connections. So this means just strategically on some of the reading pieces and sight reading cards throughout units three to five, we ask questions to help students think about note names. So for my dog Fritz, we can ask, for example, how many treble G's can you find? There's 14. Or what is the highest note that you play in this melody? B. Can you point to all of the B's on the score? So although students are not reading note by note using note names, they're connecting the notes on the page with the keys under their fingers in a certain position, and they're just building connections to note names that will serve them as they continue on in their reading journey. In unit four, students learn the interval of a third. And in unit five, sorry, they combine seconds and thirds. We like to have a whole unit of seconds and then a whole unit of thirds before they combine the intervals to make sure they really know each interval individually. So we've just finished talking about the topics of rote and reading, and let's move on to the next one, technique. In my dissertation research, I interviewed and observed excellent teachers around the United States about how they approach technique with their beginning students. And my dissertation is available on the pianosafari.com website if you're interested in reading it. Although these teachers that I interviewed used a variety of methods and came from different technical schools of thought, such as the Russian school, Taubman, Suzuki, and others, commonalities emerged in my research amongst the teachers. So we've taken these common gestures and codified them into the seven animal techniques found in Piano Safari Level 1. Here are the seven animal techniques, and they provide a strong technical foundation for beginning students of all ages and can then move on to standard patterns like pentascales, triads, scales, chord inversions, etc. after this foundation has been laid. So I'm just going to briefly show you each of the seven animal techniques. Lion Paw teaches arm weight. Tall Giraffe refines the non-legato articulation that students have been using for all their pieces and sight reading cards so far, and also introduces them to the idea of a wrist lift, which we liken to the giraffe's tall neck. Zechariah Zebra sounds like this. Zechariah Zebra, Zechariah Zebra, with each finger. And the reason we use this exercise is that it really helps form the piano hand shape. It helps firm the fingernail joints, which is a lot easier to work on if you're just repeating a note rather than moving to consecutive fingers. And it helps develop fast repeated notes with a loose arm. Tree Frog is the student's first introduction to legato. And we have an arm bounce on each note to keep the arm involved in tone production and aligned behind the plain finger. We call it a tree frog because frogs hop. That's where the arm bounce comes from. And tree frogs have sticky fingers to stick to the tree. So that's like the legato connection between the fingers. Kangaroo is similar to Zechariah zebra. So a review of hand shape and firming the fingertip joints. Kangaroo, kangaroo. 
Soaring Bird is a different kind of legato with one arm gesture over several notes. And Monkey Swinging in a Tree is an introduction to rotation. So students who master these basic gestures of piano playing are well set up for all their future technical playing. In level one, there are three types of pieces for each of these seven animal techniques. We have the technical exercise where the student learns the gesture by rote, an improvisation piece where they can explore the gesture in a more free way, and a rote piece where they can use the gesture in a piece. Today, we're going to highlight just one of the seven animal techniques, the first one, which is the lion paw. Although just the right hand exercise shows on this slide, there's an exercise for left hand as well for all of the techniques. The technique is always taught by rote so that students are able to pay close attention to the technical gesture rather than being distracted by the score. In the following video, watch how this student works on the lion paw technique at the piano. As you will see, the stuffed lion is sleeping at the piano and only wakes up when the student plays a correct lion paw drop with a loud sound and a loose arm. We often use props like this to teach technique to make it more fun and memorable for young students. You did. Okay, he's asleep now. You might have noticed when you watched the video that this particular student was using a very large motion for her lion paw drop. At the early stages of learning a technique, we feel that exaggeration of the motion is normal and even beneficial. It's easier to start with a large movement and minimize it rather than starting with too small a motion. This student continued to work on refining this technique in future lessons. Roaring Lion, Crouching Lion is the improvisation piece for the lion paw technique. So students learn the Roaring Lion and Crouching Lion parts by rote, and then they can explore the gesture with the Your Lion part in which they make large lion paw drops using any white key. So that's an improvisatory element of this piece. After these three parts are learned, we put the piece into a form as shown on the second page or the student can use cards provided on our website to create their own order, which is another element of improvisation is choosing the form of the piece. Um, so you, you'll see that in this video. Oh. improvisation piece. Each technique in level one has a corresponding rote piece. So this one, King of the African Drum, is played entirely with finger twos with an open hand and it uses both hands. This piece is in unit one, so students play it in the earliest days of their lessons 
and it's very motivational for them because they love making a big sound and also using a wide range of the piano. So I'll play this one for you. safari is improvisation. There are two types of improvisation pieces found in level one. The first is related to the seven animal techniques like roaring lion, crouching lion, and the second are standalone improvisation pieces. I have chosen today chipmunk blues from our preschool method piano safari friends because I have a cute video to show you. But there is a similar 12 bar blues improvisation in level one also. So the way we teach this is we get some page marking tabs and then mark the keys that the student is allowed to use, four notes from the, the 12 bar from the blues scale, um, right on the keys, as you'll see in this video. That way the student knows exactly what keys they can play that will match with the accompaniment. understand about teaching Piano Safari is that it uses a unit-based approach. So in each unit, there are various types of pieces, as we've talked about in this webinar. So the teacher has the freedom within a unit to assign the pieces in any order that works well for each individual student. Some days, the student may need a new reading piece, while other days, the student may need a new rote piece. The student gradually learns all of the pieces in the unit, and then they graduate to the next unit. This allows for a balanced assignment, which may include several reading pieces, sight reading cards, rote pieces, a technique exercise, and then also incorporating review pieces that have already been mastered. To summarize, in level one, students learn rote pieces based on keyboard patterns that move all over the keyboard and expose them to a variety of sounds and styles. And at the same time, they're learning to read music through reading pieces and sight reading cards, and they read unisons or repeated notes, seconds and thirds. They form a good technical foundation by learning the basic gestures found in the seven animal techniques and they create music in their improvisation pieces. In level two, students continue to learn rote pieces such as flamingo dancers, and alongside that they are reading in increasingly uh, complicated reading pieces and sight reading cards. They're in reading intervals of seconds through fifths in level two and also learning all the note names on the staff. Level two has a separate technique book where students learn pentascales and triads in all major and minor keys, as well as other important gestures through special exercises. And one new component in level two are what we call challenge pieces, which introduce students to standard repertoire by such composers as Gerlitt and Czerny. In level three, we move to a multi-key approach. So each unit of the book is centered around a key, C, G, F, and their relative minors. So um, what they learn in their technique, their sight reading cards, and their repertoire all correlates and revolves around a key. In level three, there are no more rote pieces because their reading and playing levels have merged by this point. 
The three levels of piano safari for the older student follow the same pedagogy as our method for younger children, but it moves at an accelerated pace and has more sophisticated themes. So this series is designed for beginners ages 10 through adult. And our newest method is Piano Safari Friends, which is designed for young beginners ages four through six. So on the left is the student pack, which is the book and sticker book. And on the right are some of the correlating teaching aids, like the music alphabet cards, animal rhythm patterns, and the piano decorating kit. So we hope you enjoyed our brief tour through level one of Piano Safari. Our website is pianosafari.com and you can always email us with questions at info at pianosafari.com. So right now I'm going to stop my screen share and see if we have any questions we can answer. Hey folks, before we get to questions, Catherine, I know you have to run. Thanks for joining us today and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. Yes. Thank you so much, everybody. Now, Julie's going to stay with us to answer questions, folks. So if you have any questions, throw them in the chat box, throw them in the Q&A. You can also use the raise your hand feature if you want to come on live and you can, we can have your audio featured so that you can ask uh, directly. One thing that I notice here is just this maximum creativity. You've done a great job with um, wrapping our heads around and giving us really concrete ideas for how to teach technique to beginners with seven different uh, animals and, and different things that they can do with their arms. It's something I haven't really seen much of in other levels. And I also yeah. appreciate the minimalist page where you do have drawings, but they're just strictly in grayscale in the background. So the students not getting distracted looking around the page all that much. Yeah, we, um, we opted to go with black and white because the students can always color the pictures, but because we wanted to have the pages as clean as possible. Yeah. That was one of the surprising things in my dissertation research is when I started teaching piano, I thought that technique was playing pentascales or, you know, um, yeah. but I wasn't quite sure how to how to do that. Like what were they allowed to bounce their arm? Did they need to keep their fingers all glued to the keys? How, how to do that? So it was very surprising when I went and interviewed these teachers and read lots of books about technique to find that those aren't even what the, these teachers started with. Instead, they started with this these basic gestures. And one of the interesting things, um, John Weems, one of the teachers in my study who has multiple prize winning students, um, he said he, he uh, looks at students like rubber bands. So you hold them back at the beginning and move at a slow and steady pace, laying all the foundations of technique and reading. And then at some point, you let them go, and he said, they're playing Prokofiev sonatas. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of repertoire between that, but it really um, highlights the importance of being slow and careful at the beginning stages, because then as they enter the intermediate stages, they can shoot ahead into, into more difficult repertoire. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that's one of the things we're trying to achieve here right off the bat. Um, with this whole beginner series in the webinars is to, is, is to have that approach first and foremost, slow and steady. And for teachers out there, and, and most of you on this webinar know it's just taking our time to get to that grade one conservatory level. What can we do in advance to prepare them? Because yeah, when you let the rubber band go, then things get really interesting. Um, how do you go about illustrating that for teachers through the beginner method, those seven specific techniques? How do you show them exactly what to do with the arm, et cetera? Well, on our website, we do have free teacher guides that can be downloaded with step-by-step um, -step instructions for teaching every single piece in the books. Also, we just this fall launched our Piano Safari Pedagogy Institute. So we have live courses at some times, and we also have pre-recorded versions. So we have an in-depth um, course on Piano Safari Friends and Piano Safari Level 1 right now. So you can join the live course that those happen in the fall semester, um, or get the pre-recorded version and learn all about it. And we go in depth about every single piece and how to teach each technique. Because um, I know every single thing that could go wrong now with teaching these pieces, since I've taught so many kids how to play like Alphabet Boogie, I know all the pitfalls. So, <laughs> so um, we can just explain how it all works. So it sounds like there's this detailed support that you're able to offer teachers that want that. Right. Yeah. So we have different levels of support. So we have the teacher guides you could just read on your own or mm -hmm. these videos as well that explain right. it in detail. Okay. Is there a tuition based thing to join those or are uh, they just free yeah. and open? You, you can just, uh, so the teacher guides are free, but the um, courses are paid 
you just go on and buy yeah. it like you would buy a book. You just buy the course. So the really? ones you can just watch at your leisure for six months. Right. Yeah, Kim is saying here in the comments, this is her second year using Piano Safari and her students have been absolutely loving it. So that's good to hear. Uh, Paula has a question. How do you match the need for light arm with arm weight? Um, well, our goal at the beginning is to just help students find a relaxed arm. That's the main goal, like through the lion paw. So we do have them drop with a heavy arm and then make sure it's loose. And then I'd say that having a lighter arm, if you're talking about like up motions, um, comes later as they progress. So um, the technique starts broadly from the arm, the larger muscles, and then moves gradually to the fingers. And then from there you can refine because there's like thousands of ways we can approach the piano in different touches. So it's always a constant um, refining that comes, That I think that would come a little bit later on. Right. One thing we're hearing from teachers in Canada a lot is they want to understand, we don't call it rote playing, although that I think is what we're getting at, but the idea of improvisation. And so it's a little bit different than rote playing. And that's the one thing that struck me in your level. And I'm wondering what that ratio is between rote playing pieces and reading pieces in, in level one, let's say. It's about half and half. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, that's interesting. You bring up the idea of rote with improvisation because uh, rote pieces are specific pieces and we teach them exactly how to play them on the keyboard. Um, but they're because they're not just random notes, you know, it's like very keyboard uh, pattern based that the kids can understand. We found that um, they come into their lessons all the time saying, I made up my own piece. And these pieces sound remarkably similar to their rote pieces because they take these patterns that they understand and then manipulate them to create their own music. And that never happened to us when we used to teach reading only based methods that only happened. That's one of the benefits of teaching rote pieces. Um, so that's been really interesting to see. And then they're using those rote pieces and patterns that they find and even applying it sometimes to their reading pieces. I have one little student, he's I think he's just turned nine and he's constantly saying, wait a minute, in this sight reading card, that's just like in this piece. And uh -huh. oh, I think I just made up a new piece. <laughs> he's like full of ideas. So they all integrate to form the well-rounded pianist. So they're they're getting the, the notation reading and they're getting their aural skills and the creativity built in there at the same time through this combination. That's an interesting thought. It's interesting here. I know for myself, I'd be challenging myself. Okay, now can I come up with an accompaniment on the spot for this new piece that they've created? <laughs> okay, anybody else have any questions here for Julie? A really a remarkable method, I think. Um, and I didn't realize it was so new. Are you saying that it's only come out in the last couple of years? No, um, it was about 15 years ago. Oh, 15 years ago. Okay. Okay. And That's what I thought. In 2018. Um, so that one's a little newer. And then Piano Safari Friends, our preschool method just came out two years ago. So that's for four to six year olds and provides a really good foundation before they get to level one. It's almost all uh, rote playing because four year olds developmentally usually aren't quite ready to start reading. So um, the Friends book provides a musical rhythmic foundation before they get to level one. And then we've heard from countless teachers that after students go through friends, they just fly through the beginning of level one, especially. And um, so now I put all my six-year-olds in friends first before they move on to level one. That's good to hear because I know myself, I avoid teaching five or six-year-olds because I just don't have that experience or material. So I'm gonna take a look at that. Um, okay, anybody else, any questions here? This goes up, you're going up to level three. Is that what you currently have up? Yep. And eventually, I mean, we're always writing new books. Um, after level three, we have the Advancing Pianist series, which is sight reading and technique continuing on. And eventually I do side research on um, repertoire because that's my thing. Um, yeah. So eventually we will have a graded anthology series as well. But that's still a couple years in the future. So lots in the lots in the pipeline here that you're still working on. That's great to hear, too. So and, encourage everyone uh, to go over to pianosafari.com and have a look at all the rich resources there and get an overview of it. Um, yes. but, but Sorry, I cut you off there. What else would you say? Sorry. Our books are available at Long and McQuaid um, mm -hmm. on their site and also King Music in British Columbia. So we, we are available in Canada or you can order from our website as well. 
but don't order on Amazon because we're not on Amazon. So anything you find on Amazon is not really us. Right. You so never you're know. Like you get the UK version if you order from you. Just order from us instead. Yeah, I can only imagine. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Julie, for being here. And, and Catherine, who was here with us previously, and to those watching on replay. And again, the email address, if anyone has any questions, what's that email address again? It's info at pianosafari.com. Info at pianosafari.com. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for your attention today. Uh, thanks, Julie. We'd like to have you back sometime. If there's other things you want to present, you want to go into level two or three or other repertoire research, just feel free to reach out to us, and we'd love to hear from you again. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, take care, everyone. We'll see you next Friday with Eleanor and Cecile. Have a great weekend. Bye for now.